Throughout her reign, her fashion has always mirrored the role that she plays in society. The Queen saying, I have to be seen to be believed, shows how well she understands her role. Her fashion and its consistency reflects the fact that she is this character that has underpinned 70 years of British history. Style is timeless, whereas fashion is all about the changing trend. When we're talking about royal fashion, what we're often talking about are the rules and expectations that members of the royal family are expected to follow when they're dressing for the job. There's no sort of official royal fashion guidebook. They always want to look right for the occasion. They're designed to be on the front pages of newspapers, to be going viral on social media. Royal style is about the individual interpretation of those rules by different members of the royal family. For hundreds of years, royal style has been a topic of fascination. The royals have enormous influence and their personal style reflects the times and their personalities. The phenomenon of royal women influencing fashion is nothing new. But why are we so captivated by what they're wearing? The recent evolution of their style has reinvigorated our love affair with the monarchy. Against a backdrop of pageantry and tradition, their chic and classic style has developed into something royal but relatable. By mixing trend-setting with cultural customs, they represent the modern monarchy. Queen Elizabeth II is the most famous woman in the world, and although she may not be thought of as a trendsetter or trailblazer in the fashion world, if asked to define style, the Queen is the perfect example. Smart, sophisticated and unique, she has a style that's recognised wherever she goes. From her days as a fairy tale princess to the present day as the longest reigning British monarch, now in her late 90s, her style evolution has exemplified the modernisation of this great monarchy and of British style and culture. My sister is by my side. And we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. From an early age, Elizabeth's fashion choices have been closely observed. As a young princess, in a wartime Britain, Elizabeth's clothing reflected the austerity the country faced. She did not dress lavishly, but rather conservatively, often matching her younger sister, Princess Margaret. I don't know how the Queen would have felt about being uh, dressed the same as her sister, who's four years younger than her, but I'm sure lots of children might be a little bit frustrated about that. And I guess when you're very young, you don't mind too much, but as you get a bit older, you might want to wear things that you personally feel more comfortable in. Um, but I think it was a very clever strategy from her parents to show off these two little girls and show them as equals for as long as they could before the Queen fulfilled her destiny. She really wasn't that fussed about the specific clothes that she had to wear. She was a very active young girl, and as long as she could run around outside and adventure all she wanted, that was fine with her. It was very, very important in the eyes of her parents that Margaret and Elizabeth should be dressed identically and to be dressed in quite a plain fashion. There was nothing particularly princessy about what they wore. It was to try and teach them to always keep one foot on the ground and that you can't always rely on lovely sparkly dresses to prove that you're doing a good job. You have to back it up with actions. I think the Queen and her family, despite all their treasures and riches, have actually always had a very sensible attitude to clothes. You know, they're very conscious of not wasting things, of reusing materials. There are lots of stories of 
uh, her mother's ball gowns being repurposed into dresses for her and her sister. So there's quite a thrifty element to their style, actually, despite their their grandeur. And I think that would have gone down really well during during the war when everyone was really suffering and the nation had to pull together. And there are stories of the Queen knitting, of her giving her coats to um, other children who might need them more as well. So I think she was always really aware of her own privilege and, you know, wanted to be very generous to others as well. So one of the biggest changes that affected the world of fashion generally in the Second World War was the introduction of austerity measures and austerity regulations. These restricted the amount of surface embellishment that could be included on a dress. They even limited the number of seams that certain items could be made using. And this was all in an effort to preserve these valuable materials that were in very short supply. One of the major introductions was ration coupons, which were to prevent people from spending lavishly. And the young princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, they were not given any exceptions to this rule. They had to follow them. And this was incredibly important for Elizabeth because she was very aware that she was a lot safer than the majority of the people in the country. And she felt very guilty about that that she wasn't truly having the same experience as everybody else. Princess in overalls. On her 19th birthday, the heiress presumptive to England's throne learns a few facts about tires and carburetors. Elizabeth is in the ATS, or British WAC, and at the king's request, is being treated just like any other trainee. Now visited by her parents and sister Margaret Rose at a training station in southern England, she shows them she knows a fan belt from a spark plug, all right, and isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Her father gave her an officer's commission early in March. So this was another way for her to continue to understand the country at large. It came at a very awkward time. She was in her teenage years, she was growing very rapidly, which meant she often needed new clothes quite quickly. So to get around these austerity measures, she would borrow her mother's clothes, even some of her father's clothes. So the queen in this period really reflected this sort of pull yourself up by the bootstraps and do what you can with what you have. There are certainly lots of quotes um, and lots of information which suggests that she wasn't obsessed with fashion, that the Queen wasn't poring over the latest fashion magazines. But I think she would have learnt from her mother that in the role that she was going to have as an adult, that clothes were very important. And so she would have taken an interest in that sense, knowing that she had to look the part, but she wasn't necessarily wanting to wear all the latest designers and tap into every trend going. Norman Hartnell was well known to be one of Queen Elizabeth's favorite designers. He was born in South London to a couple who were wine merchants and he became interested in fashion watching musicals in London's West End. His love for a dramatic and detailed dress stayed with him. At the height of his career as a designer, he famously said, I despise simplicity. It is the negation of all that is beautiful. When Hartnell relocated his studio to the heart of London's high fashion and close to Buckingham Palace, his relationship with the royals began to blossom. Lady Alice Montague Douglas Scott asked him to design her bridal gown for her wedding to the Duke of Gloucester, as well as bridesmaid dresses for the young princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. He continued to be a treasured designer to the royals, as when Princess Elizabeth grew up, she asked Hartnell to design two of the most important dresses of her life, her wedding dress and the ceremonial gown worn at her coronation. When her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten of the Royal Navy is announced, the heart of the world is thrilled by the prospect of one royal wedding with a genuine aura of romance. A former Greek prince, Philip gave up his Greek citizenship to become a British subject. On the eve of the wedding, the king elevates him to the peerage, and he becomes officially His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Marionette and Baron Greenwich.
Elizabeth began working with Norman Hartnell as a designer because he had very, very good connections with other members of the royal family. Elizabeth's mother really trusted Norman Hartnell with a lot of her clothes. He was her favourite designer. And so Elizabeth knew she could trust him with the important outfits in her life. So the Queen's wedding dress came at a pivotal time for Britain and the world, really. Um, it was just a couple of years after the end of the Second World War. There had been so much rationing, so much distress, really. And this was an opportunity for a real glamorous celebration. This exciting young couple, this woman who was on the cusp of becoming Queen, this was a moment of real excitement and Norman Hartnell was very conscious of showing that with the dress that he designed for her. So he took inspiration from Botticelli's painting Primavera. Um, Primavera means spring in Italian, so it's this perfect symbolism of the Queen being someone who's going to lead the world into this new post-war era. One of the things that made Norman Hartnell such an incredible designer was that he could very easily find historical inspiration and give it a modern twist and try to create a dress that was timeless and elegant and resembled those Renaissance style gowns. And her wedding dress was all about celebrating that, whilst at the same time being conscious of the difficulties which the world was still facing. And now the great hour arrives as the Queen and Princess Margaret Rose leave Buckingham Palace for the ceremony at Westminster Abbey. And Prince Philip, with split-second timing, also departs for the great rendezvous. The royal standard waves over a truly royal occasion as the state coach with Elizabeth and the King is escorted to Westminster Abbey by the household of cavalry guards, a sovereign's escort. The bride and bridegroom appeared before the cameras. The princess was now seen in the full splendor of that exquisite pearl-encrusted wedding gown which has truly been described as something out of a fairy tale. It was a beautiful, almost fit and flare gown that was covered with flowers that were taken from Botticelli paintings, made with thousands of seed pearls. It was truly a beautiful dress that represented this urge for a rebirth after the war. The King, the Queen and Queen Mary all reflected the joy of the occasion as they took their places in a memorable group. The problem was austerity regulations were still in place and ration coupons were still needed for this dress. Now obviously one that's as spectacular as this is going to cost an awful lot. The Queen saved up a lot of her ration coupons but she didn't quite have enough. So lots of brides-to-be all across the country who wanted their future queen to have the most spectacular wedding dress sent their own ration coupons. You know, she couldn't use those tokens and she just used her own with a few extra that the government granted her. Um, and she had this dress that was at once very beautiful but also understated and classic. And I think it would look as good walking down an aisle today as it did in 1947. In the Great Abbey of Westminster, Elizabeth married the man of her choice. The ceremonial drive reflected her happiness. For had she not declared as a young girl, when I get married, I shall make my husband as happy as mummy has made papa. Before long, the calls of the people were answered as onto the famous balcony came the bride and bridegroom. And so to the last chapter in a day of golden memories, as in the gathering dusk, the royal couple prepared to start on their honeymoon journey. Gathered in the palace forecourt, their majesties and Princess Margaret joined in saying bon voyage to the bridal couple, pelting them with rose petals as their carriage moved away. 
a leave-taking in which their majesty's good wishes were united with those of their people. May the present happiness of our princess and her sailor husband grow ever deeper for the years to come. So the coronation gown was a completely unique commission for Norman Hartnell. I mean, this is a, a real once in a lifetime creation. And he worked very closely with the Queen uh, to create something completely perfect for the moment. Recently, I have been honored by a request from the office of the Earl Marshal to design alternative robes for the coronation. Apart from the robe, there was another very interesting job to be done and that was the designing of a cap of state, which take the place of the commonlet worn hitherto. Now, this was a particularly interesting job for me because I, th I think it's the first time that there has been an alteration in traditional apparel since the days of Queen Anne. So Norman Hartnell had already been working in the coronation preparations long before he was invited to create the Queen's dress. He had been asked to update some of the robes that were to be worn by the peerage. And maybe it was his success with those, with updating them and giving them a more modern feel, that made Elizabeth think he was definitely the man for the job. This traditional court robe, you see, is really in three pieces. It has the ermine cape, and then it has this fitted kirtle, <laughs> and then the long train. And I've tried to incorporate all those ideas into this one garment. There is the ermine cape coming round the shoulders, there it's fitted at the waist, and that has the, the train. But of course, it's not quite as long as the original, because this one is only 18 inches on the ground. That had all been done because of the economy side of it. She wanted something that had a similar feel to her wedding dress, that really honoured the tradition and the history behind the coronation event, whilst also giving it a modern air. Rather than looking at Renaissance inspiration again, Hartnell looked at the mid-Victorian period, which was a favourite of his. So he created a design that featured a beautiful sweetheart neckline, a lovely full skirt, and was very, very plain. When the Queen saw the designs, she loved them, but she did have a few problems. First of all, she thought that the dress should have the emblems of all the Commonwealth nations, not just those of the United Kingdom. So Hartnell had those added. But the Queen also thought that the dress was just a little bit too similar to her wedding dress and asked if he could include some colour in the designs. So he ended up using a multi-coloured supply of diamonds to create the emblems. Um, and it was a, a really beautiful um, white dress with incredibly intricate, brightly coloured floral embroideries. All the different flowers represented the different territories which the Queen would reign over. You had everything from English roses to Welsh leeks. Um, Hartnell wanted to have daffodils on the dress, but leeks were the official Welsh emblem, so he, he had to go with that through to Wattle for Australia. Um, so it was this whole array of beautiful flora and fauna which um, adorned 
the coronation gown and made it an absolutely spectacular design. It was very structured um, and the Queen is said to have described it as being like a radiator to wear because there were so many layers to get on. But it really has stood the test of time and really looks very spectacular still today. As this day draws to its close, I know that my abiding memory of it will be not only the solemnity and beauty of the ceremony, but the inspiration of your loyalty and affection. I thank you all from a full heart. God bless you all. Another dress that garnered much attention was the famous magpie dress. Designed by Hartnell, it was nothing like his usual designs. It was simple and lacked any intricate detail. The dress wowed the public to such a degree that, within 24 hours, hundreds of recreations were made in different colour combinations. So the first decade of the Queen's reign was really a time of trial and error and trying to figure out what her version of a royal wardrobe looked like. And so we see some styles that we've never really seen her use again. She attended um, a film premiere in London and she was wearing this incredible gown which has since been called the magpie gown. It was made by Norman Hartnell and it was almost a menswear inspiration. It looked a little bit like a tuxedo at the top with these um, big lapels and then this very beautiful full skirt. It was a black and white dress, so very striking and quite different to the styles of the time. The dresses that Hartnell would create for royalty were incredibly elaborate, really exquisitely detailed. They had a real Victorian charm to them. The magpie dress was incredibly chic and very, very simple, which meant that it could be very easily replicated, and it was. And the photographs of this dress um, were in all the newspapers the next day, and they even showed people how they could recreate the dress at home. They reproduced patterns, and there were copies of the dress that could be bought in shops. So it, it was a real example of this um, young, glamorous queen influencing everyone's style. This was something that the royal family weren't quite ready for yet. There was still an understanding that royal fashion should be something that people admired, that they aspired towards, but that they could never truly replicate. It kept them feeling exclusive. I think it's very telling that the Queen never wore this dress or any dress similar to this ever again. As the Queen grew into her role as monarch, she also found and nurtured her own sense of style. In the 1950s, she had a very feminine look, which she carried off effortlessly with her youthful sparkle. Standing at last on Australian soil, on this spot that is the birthplace of the nation, I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. As she matured, she turned away from the nipped-in dresses to more sensible skirt suits, from pastels to bright and daring colours. This signalled a transformation from the delicate, almost mystical princess to a strong and capable queen. Hardy Amis was another very important designer for Queen Elizabeth II. His mother was a dressmaker and he followed in her footsteps, opening up a salon in Savile Row after having served as a special operations executive in British intelligence during the Second World War. There are more uh, experimental clothes produced in Paris than in London. He became official dressmaker to the Queen in 1955 until he retired in 1989. 
So Hardy Amy's was really pivotal for the Queen's fashion evolution. Um, he started designing for her when she was still a princess and he designed some really gorgeous, fashionable outfits for her in the 1950s. But what he was very conscious of was that the Queen couldn't be wearing these trend-setting clothes forever. So gently and slowly together, the Queen and Hardy Amy sort of went on this journey uh, through the late 20th century, always adapting the designs for what would work for the Queen at the time and nodding to fashion without being a slave to it. Um, and he knew the demands of the Queen's role as well and would create designs for her that would always make her feel comfortable. So she would write to him telling him that sh she was going on a, a tour to very hot places and would need cool clothes. And he, or she would tell him that she was going to certain places and he would think up outfits w which would um, give a real diplomatic nod to that visit. So that they worked really beautifully together and some of her best outfits were designed by Hardy Amy's. Hardy Amos began working with the Queen when she was still a princess and worked with her right the way up until the 1980s. He was responsible for cementing her daywear looks. That's what he's most famous for. They had a very similar approach to fashion. They both believed that it should be intensely practical and suit her lifestyle. But part of suiting her lifestyle also meant that it should be royal to its core. So the look that he created for the Queen was one that was very simplistic at a first glance, but the quality of the tailoring, the quality of the fabric, it was the best available. It was incredibly expensive. So she gave off this sense of quality, of luxury, of royalty, without it being too garish. The process of finding the right dress for an occasion was not just a matter of choosing the right dress from the rack. The Queen's dressmaker would come to the palace, sketches in hand, and Her Majesty make suggestions about what she would like added or removed. The dress would be made and would undergo several rounds of fittings and adjustments to make sure it was just right. So all the Queen's clothes are really perfectly made to the highest possible standards. When you speak to the designers who make her dresses, they speak about how much attention is paid to the quality of the cloth. The Queen has been doing this for a very long time. She knows exactly what her clothes need to do for her. So she has very specific requirements about the whole process. Nothing is picked for her that she doesn't personally approve. Every design that gets sent her way, she needs to give it a tick or a cross to let the designer know whether it's good or bad. Is it gonna stand up to the challenges of a royal engagement? My memories of South Africa are part of me and I have wanted to return to this magnificent country. She needs clothes made from materials that won't crease, that will look good in all photographs, that will sparkle if they need to. So there's a really a lot of demands on the clothes that she has, which is why they have to be made to couture level standards. It's all about comfort and looking effortlessly put together at all times, no matter what she's doing. So part of that will be weighted hems and conservative necklines to make sure that there's no embarrassing slip-ups and no unfortunate photos. Any dresses that are too heavily embroidered or beaded, they need to have some cushioning so that she can sit for long periods of time and not feel uncomfortable. It's all about making her feel effortlessly graceful. She's not picking things up from the, from the high street or wearing things that are made in any old factory. You know, everything is really immaculately made and she's very passionate about British design and British manufacturing and really supporting the very best. Amos created some of the Queen's most memorable looks. One dress in particular the Queen wore to the service of thanksgiving for her Silver Jubilee at St Paul's Cathedral in June 1977. Finally the Queen's procession. 
and for the first time since her coronation in 1953, we saw the great state coach, ornate, gilded, richly painted, perhaps the world's most beautiful anachronism. The foot guards and the blue jackets presented arms. The royal salute began as the coach made its way from the palace. The striking pink dress was the epitome of elegance, worn with a unique hat by Simone Merman, with flowers hanging delicately from silk stems. His influence saw the Queen's style become less fashion-focused and more classic and understated. When I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people, and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. Although that vow was made in my salad days when I was green in judgment, I do not regret nor attract one word of it. Angela Kelly is the personal advisor to the Queen, meaning she takes responsibility for curating and designing the Queen's wardrobe. She was not formally trained, but her mother taught her how to sew so she could make clothes for her dolls. From humble beginnings, Kelly has become the Queen's most trusted advisor. So Angela Kelly joined the royal household in the late 1990s, and she observed that the Queen perhaps wasn't wearing the most flattering clothes possible. She thought that the Queen could do better, that she could wear um, more flattering silhouettes, that she could really carry off some brighter colours and some more spectacular outfits, really. And so slowly, um, Angela Kelly's influence increased and the, the Queen had a new fashion strategy in place. So Angela helped really refine her look and make her into the style icon that she is today. And Angela Kelly is really behind some of the Queen's most famous outfits of recent years. There's nobody in the world who knows the Queen's fashion like Angela Kelly. She's been her assistant for quite some time now, and it's her job to curate, to design, in even some cases, the clothes that the Queen is going to wear. She's with her almost 24-7, so she knows exactly the demands that the Queen is faced with and knows what she wants from her fashion. Angela Kelly is really the person who created the modern Queen's wardrobe. She brought in vibrancy to her wardrobe that has really helped her as she's aged. She has always been a small woman, but in recent years, with age, that has become more pronounced. So it's allowed her to be more present, to demand more attention. Even into her 90s, the Queen has maintained her interest in fashion. In 2018, she attended London Fashion Week. She wore Angela Kelly's duck egg blue dress that was detailed with Swarovski crystals paired with black gloves. The Queen sat in the front row, happily chatting with Vogue editor Anna Winter, a memorable moment for the fashion world. Kelly was responsible for the modernised look we know and expect of the Queen today. Bright colours and a filled silhouette. Even as style changes, the Queen is known to have certain elements of her wardrobe that remain the same. It's those consistent elements that help to carve out such an iconic and recognisable style. I think bright colours are absolutely fundamental to the Queen's look and you can trace back for decades that she's always loved and been very brave with her colours. So, you know, from lime green to fuchsia to purple to red to cobalt blue to uh, pastels, you know, she's never afraid to experiment or surprise us. I think that's what's so exciting. It's always a real thrill to see what the colours will be. There's always a hat, there's always that trusty Lorna handbag in place, um, her block-heeled shoes as well. So one part of the Queen's fashion that often gets overlooked is her handbags. She's always seen with a small, very practical handbag, and it's a favourite topic for royal watchers. They all like to speculate about whether or not the Queen has a hidden language with her bags. 
It's been suggested that when the Queen is out and about and having a conversation that she would like to politely wrap up, she'll pass her handbag from one arm to the other, and that will signal to her team that she's ready to move on, and they will step in and conclude the conversation. Another constant is her pearls. Pearls have always been a favourite for the royal family. The Queen Mother was never without a string of pearls, but the Queen's pearls have a very personal meaning. Her parents would gift her two pearls every birthday up until her 18th, so that by then she would have a full string of pearls. In her more off-duty moments, she really loves her silk headscarves. So if the Queen's at a, at a horse show um, or at Balmoral, um, she's guaranteed to be wearing a beautiful Hermes silk headscarf. Great thought goes into each look. In fact, the Queen often incorporates diplomatic messages into her outfits. Be it with colour choice or the addition of a historical brooch, the Queen's outfits often reflect lasting relationships with other countries. The Queen has always been very conscious to um, pay diplomatic tributes to people through her clothing when she's visiting different countries. And she's visited hundreds of countries during her reign, and she's always thought very carefully about that. So whenever she's in Australia, she'll wear a yellow outfit um, in a nod to Australia's national colour. She has um, a beautiful fern brooch that she wears if she goes to New Zealand. It was given to her by the women of New Zealand early in her reign, and the fern is a, a symbol of New Zealand, so it's always really nice to see her wearing that. She knows that the majority of the coverage of any event she goes to will be photographs. So if she can make it very, very clear where in the world she's traveling or who it is she's hosting, that adds extra punch and makes sure that that message spreads a lot further. There was a wonderful moment in the 1980s where she wore a gown embellished with California poppies when she was at um, a dinner in California. We also saw the Queen visiting Ireland in 2011. That was such a important visit for her because of the um, political history between the two countries and she really showed how successful she wanted the visit to be by wearing a gown embellished with 2,000 shamrocks. Argus Akoiza. Prince Philip and I are delighted to be here and to experience at first hand Ireland's world famous hospitality. So she will often borrow from the national colours to shape her wardrobe or the colours of the flag. She'll also look for specific emblems, particularly the national flora of that country. A very famous dress of hers is the wattle dress that she wore for her first tour as Queen in Australia, where she incorporated lots of the national colours in her wardrobe, and that dress particularly featured a spray of wattle, the national flower. The shores of Australia slip slowly away from Gothic. This will be their last view of our Southland, possibly for some years to come. But the link, always there, which their visit has so immensely strengthened, will forever remain. The Queen isn't just known for her skirt suits and block colouring. There's few things Her Majesty loves more than tending to her horses and enjoying a stroll around the country estate, activities that require a very different kind of outfit. The Queen's country look is very different to her usual uniform, but it's still a look that has remained one of her most iconic throughout her reign. So the Queen is a real country girl at heart. She has lived a very outdoorsy life. There's nothing she loves more than going on a good hike and going out on her horses. This has been part of her life since she was very little. Her mother spent a lot of time growing up in Scotland and always encouraged her family, her children, to visit Scotland regularly. 
The Queen loved going out hunting with her father and would borrow his trousers during the war so that she could continue even though she didn't have proper hunting clothes. So I think the Queen is almost as famous for her country look as she is for her on-duty uniform and she's really made that sort of upper-class British country style her own. So the essential elements of that I think are uh, the, the silk headscarf, the barber jacket um, and, a, and a kilt or perhaps some jodhpurs as well. And the Queen just looks so pristine when she wears this look. It might be a more casual, a more active kind of outfit, but she, she looks like she could have walked straight off a catwalk, to be honest, when she wears it. She just is always so well put together. Um, and I think designers have really been inspired by that element of her look. It's very prim, it's very proper. It's very similar in feel to her day-to-day -day royal clothes. It's very classic, but it has that practical edge to it. Almost a century of royal style, the Queen has made fashion history with a look that reflects the extraordinary consistency and longevity of her reign. I think the Queen communicates different things depending on the event, and that's what's so clever about her styles. She can show sympathy, she can show happiness, she can show all her emotions. So she always has the perfect outfit for the job. I think she really wants to put across a sense of continuity. She's faced so many difficulties during her reign. There's been some really challenging periods where there have been questions asked about whether the monarchy still needs to be here. So by putting across a really calming, constant look, it makes her seem like a figure that, that can't be done away with, that can't be dismissed. I think the Queen is a power woman. And I think her legacy will be, you know, showing women that they can be who they want to be and still really shine, you know, in whatever they want to do. I think the Queen, she had such a huge task ahead of her when she became Queen, when she was such a young woman. And she's really stepped up to the job and she's shown how to do it beautifully while staying true to who she is. And I think we can all take inspiration from that. Her fashion has really contributed to the image that we will see of her in 100, 150 years time, in, in a very similar way to how Queen Victoria is remembered for her mourning clothes. And it's made her this really easily identifiable figure the Queen will always be remembered by this really distinct outfit. It will very clearly mark a period in history and people will be able to identify her with ease for years to come. In a job she did not choose, in a role she must remain unbiased, where she never explains and never complains, she has used fashion to communicate her thoughts and feelings. Her style has endeared her to the public and made her one of history's greatest style icons.